All right, I think we're live. Hello, happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to the sixth Composition Masterclass. And yes, I'm not dead, just a little overwhelmed and a little overcommitted this time of year. But uh, it's all good. And so fortunately for me, and maybe for everyone else, uh, this edition is not going to be too long because I've only got two pieces on the docket and they're both pretty short, only one of which has a MIDI recording associated with it. So we can jump right in. Uh, to this first piece, which is Benny Badenhorst's Erfreulich, um, which he writes in, Good day. I saw your YouTube channel and was very impressed with your musical knowledge. Well, thank you. Um, I guess somebody had to be. Uh, I am a 15-year-old boy from a small town in South Africa. Recently, I started writing my musical ideas on paper and composed a little. I'd very much appreciate your input, advice, and ideas on how you think I could improve this piece. I'd really like to improve the harmonization of the piece as my knowledge is limited at the moment. Uh, so... Before we get into the big harmonization bit, which is, uh, I think, what really um, could improve the piece quite a bit, so I, I agree with that self-assessment. A couple of, of craft things get out of the way. Uh, you need a brace, first of all, for piano music, so a little curly bracket uh, over there. Uh, you'll see this in the second piece if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, but it's it's pretty standard. You'll, you'll know when you see it. Um, uh, first thing that jumped out at me is this big hairpin right here. Uh, and I'm of the opinion that there's no real functional difference between a hairpin and like a, a crescendo, like writing it out or shorthand for crescendo diminuendo, or um, uh, uh, having or saying poco a poco crescendo in this case, and then all these dashes which lead to where you want. I think that's probably preferable when you're talking about long stretches. So in this case, you got 16 measures. <laughs> like that's that's quite a bit. Um, I would prefer to see, you know, piano and then maybe around here or so, poco, a poco, crescendo, dash, 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 all these dashes to forte right there. Also, going from piano to forte in the span of 16 measures, not a huge difference. What you really, you really want that poco, a poco, crescendo feeling. Um, but I would probably advise you to at least start softer, uh, perhaps even go to a, a louder dynamic level. Um, just because it's very difficult to control this. Uh, and piano, for, for a pianist, like it's not just a matter of uh, making it quiet. It's a matter of like controlling the sound, making it seem a little more flowing and singing. It's, it's as much a timbre thing for a good pianist. Uh, but also, I mean, you're going from piano to mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte. Like, that's, there's not a huge difference between piano and forte. Um, and so this is what Ligeti also often did in his in his etude. So he would write like seven or eight Fs. What he was really looking at is like, okay, there's a maximum and a minimum. How do I make these small little delineations between uh, the loudest thing that a pianist can play and the softest thing a pianist can play? And which led him to these ridiculous markings, uh, you know, which, which seem a little goofy honestly but if you think about like why he did this or why he would put like uh, several different accent marks piled on top it's like he's looking for these very slight uh, uh, degrees of separation between various dynamic levels and i'm not saying you need to go like five p's here and five f's here um, but maybe pianissimo here and if not fortissimo here because i understand that fortissimo and forte are to me they've always been more different, uh, especially with the attack of a piano, um, than piano versus pianissimo. Excuse me. But I would suggest, you know, poco forte, più forte. Um, some some people go for F plus, which is like halfway between forte and, and fortissimo. Um, I've only seen that in, in some choral scores. Uh, it seems to be more of a vocal thing. Um, you might want to consider that. At the very least, give rid of this large hairpin because it, it's 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 a little over the top. Here it's fine. I think this is this is totally fine here. Um, however, going from mezzo forte to forte in what six five six measures, depending on how you want to count it, it's again we're talking about one dynamic level. It's it's just it's just not quite enough, um, especially because your forte here. Do you want to drop down to mezzo forte, sort of? subito here it's not going to be that effective because it's not a drop in a huge dynamic level and this note 
at this tempo, this chord rather, is going to die out enough that mezzo forte coming out of that's not going to seem like a huge difference between that and the forte that you have prior. Um, maybe I would I would suggest if you really want a hairpin there, starting it here and having that gesture, da -ba 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 -ba. that might be a little more effective. Um, or perhaps even a decrescendo here, like going down to mezzo piano or even piano and highlighting this because this is a very like this is a very different thing uh, from the kind of flowing stuff it is still flowing um but it's just it's uh you can definitely tell that this is a different character uh, and this is sort of a different section it seems like uh, again not having a recording of this and you know not really having the time to <laughs> do a midi mock-up myself from the score um i'm just sort of working off of this visually uh, another thing the octave marking here, typically uh, eight VA, um, is used. I've seen eight. Eight is certainly acceptable. I've used it, um, especially when you're when you're dealing with like short bursts, where eight VA seems like for two notes seems a little excessive. Um, it definitely needs to be bolded though. Like this, this seems like it's a. It seems like a somewhat older version of Muse Score. I know Muse Score used to have this issue where, if you in, if you put in an octave marking in a certain way. It liked to turn it from an audio marking, which is its own like symbol within MuseScore, um, into what's basically just an italicized eight, which is the, again the point is that okay, I understand what this means. Pianos will understand what this means. It's, it's not about making it more clear. It's about just making it look more up to up to snuff, as they say, up to standards. Up to snuff might be kind of a a southern expression. I don't know. I use a lot of southern expressions, I realized, like from the American South, even though I don't, I don't have a strong accent. Um, but sometimes I'll just be like, I'll, I'll say something random, and my roommate would be like, what's that? I'm like, it's a, it's a southern expression, you know. So I, I didn't realize how many, many of those I had in my lexicon. Uh, another thing here, uh, and this is something I, I do even have in my notes, but I noticed it just pulling up this piece prior to uh, going live here. Um, when you're in 6-8, you don't uh, talk about the tempo in terms of the quarter note because the quarter note's not really the beat here. What you're what you're looking at is the dotted quarter because it's really a big two, one and a two and a one and a two and a. Uh, so again, I, I don't have a calculator up to figure out what exactly one twenty to the quarter would be to the dotted quarter, uh, but just figure that out. You know, round it to the nearest whole number, and that's going to be your tempo. One other thing I would say. Is that erfreulich? Not everyone's going to know German. Uh, I know a little bit of German, um, but I didn't know what this was. Weil mein Fortschatz sehr klein ist. That means joy, happiness, uh, happiness. <laughs> put a T on there. Um, a general, you know, freedom. So, if you know what that word means, and you're approaching this from a pianistic point of view, uh, you'll know what the kind of character, what kind of tempo this is. But typically, you want to include a tempo marking, which is just literally the speed of it. Uh, and then beyond that, you want to have um, some kind of character marking. So a is a good it's a good German character marking. Um, but if you want something Italian, you would probably say, you know, allegretto, maybe allegro, uh, gioviale, or giocoso, uh, or if you want to use English, there's plenty of <laughs> there's plenty of options there i know in undergrad my professor used to chide me a lot for using like gratuitous italian but i was like i just like doing it you know i don't speak italian I just i like having these like nice uh, italian tempo markings it seems you know it's a good aesthetic uh, thing to do one thing i think i mentioned this before uh, is there's a you know difference between six eight and three four um and that technically if you wanted to rewrite this rhythm like it don't to be truly in six eight you would have to rewrite this as a dotted quarter tied to an eighth note, then a quarter, which looks kind of bad, <laughs> frankly. Uh, so there's no good way to, to do that. You're lucky in that you're writing this for a solo pianist. Uh, and this is, it's easy to figure this out because six, eight, three, four, ba, 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 easy, easy peasy. Um, the real question is like technically, like if you really want to get into the details, technically what what should you do here? Because uh, there's enough of this, like from here all the way to 
here, like it's definitively in 3, 4 in the left hand. Um, versus it's so clearly in 6, 8, mostly in the right hand. Here it's not, here it's not, here it's not, here it's not. Uh, it's pretty easy to see once you are attuned to what 6, 8 versus 3, 4 looks like. Um, common, I think, early mistake for, for, for young composers. Um, because, again, this is easy to understand like, where things fall. What I would suggest is because you use it so much, um, you could put a 3, 4 in sort of parentheses just here on this staff. Or maybe what you do is put 6, 8, and then 3, 4 next to it up here, but space them out such that it doesn't look like a 63, 84 time signature because you're not a new complexity composer. Uh, and you should feel thankful for that. <laughs> no, I kid. I, 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 I like a few pieces from New Complexity School, but sometimes it's just excessive. Um, what else? Oh, here, uh, when you have hairpins, they need to go somewhere. So here, what I would assume what you want here is some kind of poco di crescendo, poco crescendo. Like, it's not strong. Uh, however, when you don't put a goal dynamic marking here, you're opening yourself up to a world of hurt, potentially, because you have to be prepared for the decision that you least want made to be made. And if you're fine with that, then then you're good. You don't have to necessarily put anything in there. Um, but if you want a specific sound, or if you don't want a certain sound, it's best to put in, you know, a, I would say a poco here. And that would be an italics right under here, just as a regular... Um, as if it's a regular uh, uh, dynamic marking. Uh, one thing about dynamics is that you do, you have some. I would like to see more, um, especially from here to here. It seems like there's a lot of there's a lot of possibility uh, for more um, dynamic variation. Uh, but also, there's a lot of uh, room for more clearly explicating what you want. Uh, in terms of articulations, because if you're playing this, you know, like, what's going on. Like, you know exactly um, how this thing is supposed to be played. But if you're putting it in front of somebody, you know, again, you have to be prepared for the worst to happen. Uh, oh, is there a slight buzzing to the sound? I don't know. I've muted my mic so I don't hear myself. I was once pranked with an ASMR video, and I've never been a fan of them. Uh, maybe better? I don't know. You let me know. <laughs> Hopefully this is going to be the one we get through without any sort of technical difficulties, but, you know, <laughs> it's been a while uh, since I've used the software. Oh, it's worse? Hold on. If you saw all the cables are over here, disappointed in me. Well, let me see what this sounds like. It gets worse as I talk. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Let me just pull this out. The audio quality would get worse. I just, I just can't cut the mic entirely. Uh, it's a little old. So, if you can still hear me. Yeah, oh, quality's gone down. But it's fine. You can still hear me, that's fine. Uh, so where was I? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh yeah, so like, if I were approaching this, I would like to emphasize uh, the difference between the 6-8 and the 3-4 feeling. So I would make the 6-8 stuff more more connected, more legato, and then maybe more of a detached portato feeling um, 
here. So be da 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 ba 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 da ba. So it um no audio is good audio is good okay good thanks for letting me know y'all. Um, that's that's my first interpretation of this. Like just going in blind, not knowing what you want. That's what I think. Um, but again, you might not think that, and you know you need slurs, staccato, portato markings, character markings, uh, all sorts of stuff to really flesh this out. Uh, and then finally, uh, being asked about harmonization, and this is a huge topic, and it's very hard to like condense into a video like this, because their entire YouTube channels are devoted just to like reharmonizing things or or explaining principles of counterpoint and voice leading and orchestration, but they're all interconnected principles. From my perspective, and of course I'm I'm interested in the history of these things, the idea of harmonization is you're making use of theory. Like it's theory in practice, but it's knowing what harmonic function is and what harmonic function does. Uh, the idea is about the appreciating the relationship between sounds. So in Western theory, like the idea is that all the sounds, um, like the relationship between sounds is purely based on, you know, science and logic and reason, all sorts of stuff, which is why we have a system of tuning ultimately based on the ratio of the perfect fifth. Now we have to mess with it a little bit to make them, you know, 12 even tones. It took us a while to get there. Um, but the principle is that you have an inherent hierarchy that if you have a key and have a, or a key center or modal center or, or a fixed, you know, tonic pitch or tonic equivalent, that all the notes surrounding it are orbiting that central tone in important ways. Um, so you have like your fifth relationships, which are, you know, vastly important to most, you know, traditionally tonal music. Um, and the circle of fifths is obviously very important uh, as an extension of that. Uh, but then when you get past, you know, the, the classical era, the late Baroque, which is really when this stuff got codified, through the classical era, through the early Romantic era, uh, you start getting to like late Romantic composers like Mahler and Strauss. Um, what you're really hearing there is less a focus on like chords and chord progressions uh, and more about voice leading. And voice leading is, is huge because the, the reason that chords work like 5, 7 to 1, the reason that works is because it's good voice leading. You have the strong 5-1 motion in the bass. Uh, you have the tritone, which contracts to the root and third of the chord. You have this extra fifth of the 5-7 chord, which typically, in my mind, it descends to the tonic of your tonic chord, your, your root there, because you want to double the root in like four-part four part, uh, harmonic writing. Uh, the reason that works is like you, you have strong, this strong half-step motion. You know, in, in C major, for instance, you have like, this B the lean tone going up to C and the F going down to E. So the, those you almost think of that the half step relationships as, as leading tones. Like the reason the leading tone is so freaking important is that half step relationship, which you don't really get if you have a uh, a flattened seventh, a subtonic that is. And it's it's important to to understand like the principles behind why functional harmony works because then you can look at again I mentioned Mahler and Strauss. Strauss, like, he modulates all the time, and, like, he's using chords that make zero sense from this traditional, you know, you're looking at chords in terms of, of you know, roots and, and their relationships, and, you know, it, what you learn when you learn, like, Roman numeral analysis, like, you get, like, a 3-6-4 chord, which is, you know, passing to, you know, this strangely resolving diminished seventh and all of a sudden oh you're in the supertonic from where you started and you're like half a measure in you're like <laughs> uh, at that point it you know it makes more sense to look at the look at the big picture and say okay where is this going uh what chords why why do these chords work the way they do because it works like the, the, like strauss pulls you along is constantly developing sound world, uh, aided by a very lush and, and remarkable sense of orchestration. But the reason that his chords work is that all the voice leading is perfect. It's spot on. Like, it's not textbook in that, like, okay, you'd have, you have parallel fifths, you know, he's using 6-4 chords as, as, uh, as if they're uh, stable when they're not. Like, in my undergrad, like, you actually docked points off of your homework if you labeled a 
a 6-4 chord, like a 1-6-4 a versus a 5-6-4. Like technically it is the, the, uh, the notes of the one chord, but it doesn't really function as one. Except when you look at the composer like Strauss, like he's using that as, as if it's, as if it's a, a stable harmony. Uh, and the reason he gets away with it um, is, is that the, the voice leading works. And this is an extent, this is like late tonality. So like there's an extension of, of these kinds of tonal principles, but it's not textbook in the sense that, you know, if you wrote that kind of music on your theory assignments, you'd probably get docked some points because like you're not going exactly by the, the, the standards of the, of, of how harmonic practice was codified, like late Baroque, early classical era. So again, like voice leading is, is super important. Uh, and for that reason, like if you just take standard chords that, you know, that make a lot of sense to you, um, or that make a lot of sense in, in terms of traditional voice leading, and you just take a few notes up, a few notes down, um, you modify those chords in any way, you add, you know, ninths, elevenths, you extend those harmonies uh, up, sort of jazz style, and then mess with those. It's all about really figuring out what works and then what works in context of where you're going. Because even with, you know, late tonality, even if you're not really following those rules strictly, you're still talking about tension and resolution. Um, and in Strauss's case, like, he delays that resolution for a long time, so when you finally get it, it's very powerful. Wagner does the same thing, but it's not quite as crazily modulatory as some like late Strauss or even early Strauss like Salome is completely freaking insane um, on multiple levels um, yeah the question is I was listening to Die Frau und Schatten today does not use harmonic function yeah the idea is that the, there is still harmonic function like, these are not atonal composers um, it's it's not um, it, we're, we're not talking about like Bach or or Beethoven, like how they would use, you know, you could analyze those pieces very rigidly in terms of harmonic structure and like this is why Shinkarian analysis becomes such a big thing. It's like there's there's all these commonalities between pieces. I don't agree with Shinkaran a lot um, because his methodology is extremely specific for a very specific type of music, but it is revealing that like there is a I don't want to put this. It's it's quite revealing of uh, I completely forgot my train of thought. Gosh, <laughs> um, I, I think I made my point though. Like there's there's a, there, there's ways to to mess with chords uh, and and get some interesting harmonies out of them. But to understand the the theory behind like why does functional harmony exist is super important. Um, Oh yeah, definitely non-functional Strauss, Electra, or Sal I forgot about Electra. Like that's that's also that's also a crazy one. Um, but it's interesting because those are those are relatively early in his career, like um, because he lived until like the late forties. Because um, I'm studying one of his um, four last songs now, uh, Frühling. Um, it's I mean it's sort of sort of functional-ish. Um, I mean he he never really disregards harmony entirely, but. Again, the really non-functional stuff does does come early. I'm glad you, I'll let you mention that. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> reharmonization such a such a big deal. I kind of went around the subject because, like, you know, it, it's a very personal thing. I'm not going to say, oh, well, you know, just use more chromaticisms. Uh, that's definitely a big part of it because, like, this piece is super diatonic. I mean, you get your first accidental here. You're sort of going to E minor. Um, but it mostly is is a G major piece. All right. Next up is the Andantino in C major by Juan Santos, and I actually do have a recording of this uh, MIDI recording, so we'll listen to that and then we'll talk about it a little bit.
Ah, a cute little Mozart piece, uh, Mozart-like, rather. And then continue in C major. Um, this this sort of has the opposite problem of the other piece in that it's um, it's really in in six eight, but it's notated in two four, <laughs> uh, which makes a lot of sense uh, in that six eight is more similar to two four than three four because it's it's a subdivided two um, versus you know you're switching from six eight to three four and the the beat is obviously different even though you have the same number of eighth notes per measure. Uh, so in this, there's just a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, uh, the K numbers here, that's a specifically Mozart thing. Like that stands for the Kirchel catalog. Mm. I don't think I pronounced it that right. It has two sounds in it that are not in English, but are in German. Um, but that's, that's the guy who came back, went through Mozart's back catalog uh, and figured out like a categorization system for them, uh, which as far as I know is roughly in chronological order. I know it's been updated quite a bit. I'm not a Mozart scholar by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not like an expert in that. Um, but I do know that that's a very specifically Mozart thing. So, you know, you have like Bach, the BWV numbers. Um, you have Buxtehude, I think, has uh, Buxtwv, because, you know, B, you know, Bach gets that. Buxtehude has to get a little short version of his name. Um, Haydn has the Hoboken numbers, which are interesting in that they're non-chronological in the sense that uh, they're split up into different genres, and then within those genres it tries to be as chronological as possible. Um, so it's really broken up by, by you know, he'll have a string quartets in one, symphonies in another, operas, you know, etc. With the K numbers, it's a more common way of referring to Mozart's pieces specifically because of this one catalog. Uh, and opus numbers don't really cut it because opus numbers um, refer to the publication of pieces versus the composition of pieces. So often it was on the publishers to figure out opus numbers, and there would be occasions where publishers, especially for new composers, would would just assign random high opus numbers to relatively new composers. So like Dvorak has some pretty high opus numbers early in his career, just because his publisher wanted to make him seem more established, um, and it was a, it was a known trick, so it worked. Um, and then you get opus numbers like Scriabin, for instance. There's a late opus number which like doesn't exist. Um, that or like two opus numbers were assigned to the same piece. That happened to Shimonovsky as well. Um, so sometimes opus numbers are not to be trusted. Um, typically, composers don't keep track of their pieces like this. Some do. I know that I do just for my own records. I used to put opus numbers on my pieces. I don't need more. Like, in undergrad, you know, before it seemed like, oh, it's kind of like, oh, I'm cool. I put an opus number on my piece. Like, you can if you want to. Um, but looking back on it, it just seems a little cringy and more than a little bit, uh, uh, you know, narcissistic or self-centered in some way. So I don't do it anymore on account of, like, to just never a point. I keep a list of my pieces, uh, you know, my um, from my own files and on my CV and on my website. It's like, I know what I wrote. There's, there's really no reason to keep track of it like this. So you can keep track of them if you want. K, it's a Mozart thing. You know, if you really want to keep track of, of them, you can use opus numbers. Uh, you could use uh, just a number. Number Stockhausen did that. He just had his own uh, his own catalog. Would have like would just be number whatever a, a standard standard uh, you know number sign hashtag octothorpe thing. Uh, but even then, like, you sometimes run into issues where, like, you know, maybe you go back to a previous piece and you're like, oh, I don't really like this anymore, chunk that. Then if you're kind of OCD about the number <laughs> the number line and keeping it intact, then, you know, you have a, a, a missing part of your oof. Uh, and nobody really wants that. Unless you're fine with it, in which case, you know, more power to you. Just bother me quite a bit. Um, who else keeps track of their works? Ancient Stockhausen. Somebody else, but I forgot who it was now. Um, yeah, if you if you really want to, opus numbers or just numbers. K is a, it's just just Mozart. So let Mozart be Mozart, even if you're writing in a in a very Mozart like style. Uh, yeah, I like the inclusion of of Dolce here. Not it's a nice um, uh, character marking, and uh, likewise Jocoso here. You know that that's really what you want to see. Excuse me especially for solo pieces, because you, you have to give 
the performer information on like how to play this beyond just like oh here's some fingerings oh here's some um, you know here, here's some phrase markings fingerings here don't bum, 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 bum. I, I like the fact you've included them I don't think it's absolutely necessary either I'm thinking like right here so one three one because you have this um, this rest here what you really you're setting up is like this is a hand position and then this is a hand position um, but you could play all this basically from, basically from here to here all in one hand position you could go five three one three four or I might even go five three one two three just the way my hands work um, then you could play this you can play this if you end up with three play this with five if you want I don't see the reason to cross your thumb under there you could uh, unless you have a very specific reason that you want to have a fingering I would say avoid it because everybody's hands is gonna be different everybody's, everybody's hands are going to be different so my southernisms coming out again <laughs> um, like you see this a lot in some some uh, Godovsky scores. Godovsky's like an absolute pain in the butt about this. Like he will put like there will be more fingerings than notes sometimes because he will provide like multiple fingerings for different chords. And sometimes it's it's really straightforward or it's like it doesn't like there's either one solution or it doesn't really matter. Uh, sometimes it does matter. Like uh, Granger scores are sometimes list. You'll you'll see like he'll say a bunch of fingers together. So you have this like super percussive attack because like your entire fist is coming down. Um, I want to say Bartok also use that sometimes. Um, but at the very least he's very percussive and it, it does help to do that if he doesn't mark it. But this is like, you know, this is a nice fingering. I'm sure it works for you, but it's not necessarily going to work for everybody and uh, functionally there's no difference if you put in these slurs um, where they are. It, it gives a good sense of, you know, when to change hand position you know how to phrase things, and that's, that's all, that all. It's all interconnected. It's not like you know, because your phrasing does change a little bit based on how comfortable your hands are in a certain place. Uh, also, I think I've mentioned this in other master classes before, but uh, slurs always go the other, the other way. So unless you have multiple voices on a single staff, uh, you want your slurs to go opposite the direction of the majority of your stems. So if your stems are going up, slurs go under. Stems are going down, slurs goes on top. Here, um, this is part, again, this is like, this is really weird because this is like the version I was talking about earlier. Um, you don't really need this when it's this short. I think just a, just a hairpin would be, would be perfect. Or if you just want to put crescendo, you don't even have to put the dash in there because it's so close um, it it makes a lot more sense <laughs> pedal markings you can do this if you want to um, it's a lot more clear just to put lines like that shorthand uh, I've never been a fan of this just because sometimes it, it can be a little bit um, ambiguous as to where you want to put the pedal down especially right here like you put the pedal down between these two notes like clearly you want this Blurred because like these are a lot of notes here. That's gonna they're gonna all sound together at this tempo. Um, yeah, I maybe 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 rethink that a little bit um, because the rest of it seems like you're what you're not really putting in much pedal here. So is the idea that this the pedals up to the performer's discretion unless it's right here? That's one of those things that you know you have to be prepared for a pianist to take this so literally that there's no pedal and all of a sudden. Boom, pedal down there, blur, then back to, you know, as before. A few things to just keep track of here. Um, again, Andantino, character is conveyed pretty well by the title of the piece and just the general markings here, uh, as well as, uh, as what the dynamics say about it. But still, it would be nice to have at the very least, you know, some character marking. Because you have Andantino as the title of the piece, you don't need to have, you know, Andantino again right here. Um, but, you know, Simplice, or 
something and then add a you know coordinate equals whatever you're at here uh, it's it's good practice because you'd rather give a performer too much interpretive information than none at all and, and right now I think it's a it's still a little bit on the lack side even though you are putting these character markings in this should be centered it's one of these small things uh, occasionally you'll have like misaligned rests so like or this I don't know how that happened uh, and misaligned rest there again these are like little things but I have this weird knack. Uh, I don't know exactly why I'm cursed with this, but every time I look at a score, like I immediately see all of the typos. Like, I, I guess it's what makes me good at doing this kind of stuff. But like, uh, last semester I took a class and we looked at the entirety of Hans Abrahamsen's Schnee, uh, which is like over a hundred pages of full score. Like, it's a huge piece um, for um, double piano quartet, or no. Yeah, piano quartet and percussion. Um, and immediately I was like, well, there's a missing rest there. Oh, that should be an eighth note. Oh, the 32nd note's off there. And people were like, what are you doing? Like, I don't, I can't help it. It's just, it's, it's I'm just cursed with this. I'd rather not, because they just pop out to me. Ah, uh, what else? What else is here? Oh, the, the use of these triplets. I, I was mean to uh, loop back around to this. I would say put this in 6 8. You have enough of these, of these uh, triplets. If you really insist on using, Two four, I would say put the triplets through the first two triplet groups. Um, maybe even for the first two measures you use them, and then where you would have a three, like right here or right there, put sem. So right in the same font and size that you would have dolce or the triplet there, um, and that makes it it makes it obvious uh, what you want there. Again, from the perspective of a single performer, it's clear. Uh, but you can always make things you know more clear, more more precise. Uh, yeah, I think that's a uh, that's about it for this. Well, a very short short edition today on uh, on this Valentine's Day live stream. Let's see if there's any questions. Uh, Non-pianist here. Are finger markings in the composer should have regardless of situation, or left to discretion of the player with limited exceptions? All a string bowing. I would say the latter. Just like, again, coming from a pianist's perspective, like, I've seen a lot of, I mean, I don't play the piano that much anymore, but, like, that's how I started, and, yeah, I can still, I, I still know my way around. Uh, most editions of scores that I've seen, I very rarely completely agree with the, with the fingering. And a lot of times, you can figure out why a fingering is a certain way, like, you can figure out, like, oh, if someone has a especially long or dexterous, you know, finger that they like to use, um, um, or... Maybe they're not so adept with like their their ring or pinky fingers. You can understand why certain fingers work for certain composers or certain editors rather. Um, it's, it's more of an editor thing that I have a problem with because most editions it's added by editors, like pianists who go back and perform this stuff a lot, and it's very idiosyncratic. Uh, idiosyncratic, and then if you look at an edition of you know the Beethoven sonatas by you know some some famous pianist you'll see, you know, exactly what they did. So if you want to recreate, like, their interpretation of a piece, you know, it's good to go, like, to their editions. Uh, in the same way that, you know, with, with Inescu, like, you know, his editions of, uh, personal editions of scribbled in, like, how he fingered, like, the box sonatas and partitas, the equivalent, you know, fingerings uh, and bowings on a violin, it's the same thing. Like, it gives a good insight into what the performer does. I wouldn't recommend doing it, because it's just, unless you have very specific reason, like the Granger that I mentioned earlier, like, you really want something bunched together, I don't see any reason to do it because it, it muddies up the score. Performers are going to make notes to themselves anyway, and you know they're very rarely going to agree with you on there. Heart pedaling is sort of in between those two, or or not between those two because those two are bowings and fingers are similar. But heart pedaling is one of those things that I've always included it, um, just because whenever I've written heart parts, they have a tendency to be kind of chromatic. Um, more chromatic than I think a lot of harp players would like, um, and it, it helps me to write good harp parts to keep track of like what strings are at what location. And sometimes like I write myself into a corner where you know you have to use a certain combination or a certain spelling that makes the most sense. But even then, I, you know, I know I know some harpists that will tell composers based on basing their assumption on that oh composers don't know how to write for harp, um, they'll 
they'll tell composers not to put them in. Just be aware of the limitations of it, but not necessarily write the harp pedalings in. Um, of course, I'm not a harpist. I've, I've known many harpists. Um, so I've, I feel like I've gotten their blessing to be, you know, to be, to be doing this because I, I do have a certain knowledge of how it works. Um, but again, like, but, but that's something that I think you can learn how to do right because there is sometimes one solution there. Whereas the fingering, bowing, you know, if you, if you put in phrase markings, if you put in character markings, yeah, you should be fine. Uh, last question, should I study music starting at early to modern or to understand modern harmony? Um, I would say so, just because you have to know where things came from. Like, you, you, have, to, you have to understand why non-functional harmony is non-functional. You can't just say, well, well this chord is non-functional. It's like, well, it has a function, but you know, some of it's contextual as well. I would definitely suggest starting with you know, as early as possible, like getting the basics of, of harmony. And then as you look at pieces throughout history, you'll see like more innovations, like in, in Bernstein's words, like more um, ambiguities until eventually you, you have so much chromaticism, you have so much, so many non-functional chords, that even though you have tonal chords and, um, you know, keys to a, to a certain extent, uh, you eventually land in a world of like, Abamberg's B minor piano sonata, which is not really in B minor. Like, it's beginning and the end. That's about it. Um, I, I do think that it is, it is a little bit of a misnomer that, like, the 12 the tone technique and, like, uh, you know, atonal harmony or, you know, early Schoenberg for atonality emerged sort of fully formed. Because if, if you look at the history of it, it was like, you're still looking at tonal pieces in the late Romantic style being written up to the, up through the deaths of Rachmaninoff and then Strauss. So Strauss was kind of like the last of of the dying breed. But you look at his pieces and like they're they make as little sense in the traditional like common practice tonal approach um, as early Schoenberg does. Uh, I mean, because like, even early Schoenberg, like Verklärte uh, Nacht, is just it's a gorgeous piece, but like people didn't understand it then because there's like weird inverted ninth chords, which like it, again, voice leading total sense. Um, but I would say that in order in order to properly understand voice leading, um, you you need to know like the basics of harmony, like how did harmony evolve, um, and, and then see how it started to branch out as composers got more innovative uh, towards. Uh, the, the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, see, that's, uh, I, I think that's about it. So yeah, anybody else has any more pieces to send in? I, I try to do these uh, like once every four videos or so, um, but it depends on, you know, if I get any, get any pieces uh, submitted. And also I'm trying to, I'm trying to go on like a two, a video every two weeks schedule. Um, I got kind of, excited and I, I, I published the Greek and an Esco video was like right in a row. I was like, oh, I can do one every week and then things got way too crazy because I had like four deadlines. Uh, that's now at the at the end of the, not the end of the semester, the end of this month. Um, and I'm also, I, I recently joined a new gamelan group at, down at MIT. It's like, which is <laughs> really good. It's like, that's a real all-star outfit compared to my old gamelan back in North Carolina. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm staying busy. So, uh, considering the amount of time it takes to like prepare and like research and you know film and edit these things, uh, I can only I can basically I can I can film or I can research. <laughs> like this, it takes about the same amount of time to to research something versus like film and edit and upload it. Um, and considering the amount of time I have probably to work on this channel specifically, uh, it's probably going to be once every two weeks. But yeah, hopefully new stuff is is coming soon. I have. Um, two videos that are, you know, waiting to be uh, published, which gives me enough time to, you know, do some other ones. Um, I should be doing some remakes of older videos. It's something I mentioned to some people before. It's like, I don't like some of the older stuff. It's like, my original version vision of the channel was very different from what it turned into, and I'm totally fine with that. But it means, like, my video on Bach is, like, really short and doesn't hold a candle to, like, more minor figures that I've done since. 
And I feel like I could really do a good job of, like going back to Bach, Scriabin, Cage, uh, Cowell, and, and kind of going into that in, the, in, the, in, the, in more of a, an in-depth thing. Uh, so that's hopefully coming pretty soon, in addition to like working through requests and uh, also a video on uh, a landmark 20th century opera, which is going to be quite fun. I have some on-location stuff to do and possibly some more costumes. So <laughs> I always like doing things that are more cinematic. Well, until next time, thanks for hanging out. Signing out.